all of us at OTTX, I want to thank you for joining us today. The series where we bring you insightful, thought-provoking presentations across a broad spectrum of OTT-related topics from thought leaders across our industry. Uh, Direct-to-consumer, D2C streaming platforms have turned many content owners into their own distributors, meaning the provision of high-quality enriched metadata has become an in-house problem. Today, we're excited to have with us two executives and experts who are well steeped with knowledge and experience about metadata and its management to help us understand how to take control of this data to the benefit of our customers and our entire organizations. These folks are Rob Delph, CEO of Meta and David Lipsy, renowned DAM and MAM industry strategy, strategist at FCX3. Rob Delph serves as Meta of CEO of Meta as CEO of Meta where he is responsible for strategic growth initiatives and managerial decisions. A seasoned entrepreneur specializing in entertainment and media software, he previously founded and served as the CEO for RightsLine. His past experience spans diverse roles in marketing, consulting, new media businesses, and digital media strategy for some of the world's largest media companies. David Lipsy is well known as founder of the field of digital asset management and a consistent innovator in defining and redefining MAM and DAM and the relationship to organizational strategy, rights, outreach, and growth. David has worked internationally to create value from digital assets and setting in place the organizational and strategic processes to achieve return and an, on initiative as well as investment. I know we're all looking forward to uh, their presentation. D2C means now, means now is the time to take control Centralize metadata management and enrichment and save time and money. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rob and David to get things kicked off. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for the intro, Eric. Absolutely. Nothing Appreciate better it. than a, a, to kick off the morning than a discussion of metadata. Metadata should make everyone work up energized. Exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well, or at least we'll putting it to in, in a bit. Yeah. So it's nice to be here today. And Rob, as we've had the chance to collaborate over the years, I don't think one of the things I've ever remembered to ask you is, so once you put that fine major in accounting and financial systems to work and, and got it, got, tell me a little bit about the, 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 your transformation to becoming a leader and, and now CEO of Meta um, into the M&E space. Where was, what were the bridges and what brought you to that? Well, you know, that very exciting background in accounting and technology, um, you know, re really like, you know, where, where my, my, my background comes from is, you know, I, I worked in consulting initially, and uh, I was fortunate enough to work on a number of initiatives in the large studio environments around uh, rights and title management. And really, I think, you know, great businesses are built out of frustration in a lot of respects, right? And uh, my path in this has really just grown out of being frustrated by the lack of good systems and solutions to solve certain problems. Um, in 2012, um, I launched a rights line um, and, you know, founder, CEO for, you know, almost 10 years at RightsLine, growing that into a product to solve that sort of foundational frustration around, um, lack of visibility into what you own, what you can distribute, what you can license and all that good stuff. Uh, what's, what's interesting about that is along the way, um, along the way, every single one of our rights projects would start with a, okay, great, let's load your title catalog into rights line as a starting point. And it, I'd say the majority of the time it was met with a um, 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 it would be like, well, marketing has this piece of it. And, you know, the theatrical team has this piece and home video has this piece and international. I don't even want to talk about that piece of it. Um, and, you know, it was one of those sort of foundational things where I was like, huh, there, you know, there's been a lot of custom builds in this space, but there really isn't an enterprise software product around it. So, uh, I am, I'm here. I've been fortunate enough to partner up with, um, Robin Tucker, who's the founder of Meta. Um, over in the UK, and they have just done an incredible job um, getting the product off the ground. Uh, and you know, I'm I'm really here to facilitate uh, taking that to the next level. Great! It, it's so nice to have you at the helm of this. And it's so funny. I would often think of the phrase "rights line," like we need a different geometry here. Huh. And I think that's a lot of what Meta represents, and why I also got quite interested in it. 
Yeah, we're, you know, I mean, we're really solving the rights mess, but that wouldn't make a very good name for a company, right? <laughs> and I mean, it may already be taken or at least in, <laughs> yeah, <okay. laughs> in some kind of way. I, I, for myself, having been involved in digital asset management since its inception, I think I also saw kind of the schismatic and, and, and disconnected world which were where the initial idea of well wait a minute if we've got text here and graphics here and images there can't we can't we book a kind of pipe and connect these things together yeah and i mean from 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 your standpoint you know of course um you know we've we've collaborated throughout the years but tell me a little bit about kind of your background how you got into the very specialized space that is digital asset and nam systems which is you know esoteric yet invaluable yeah, it, 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 it does run both of those kind of cross currents between esoteric and like, what do you do? I'll look at the packages of the Coca-Cola bottles, um, look inside the book. So I had been working in the newspaper industry for many years when it was a, a healthy, robust and, and very profitable world and had uh, the op been working in the software field and read about a project here in the greater Washington, D.C. area where I live that Thompson, uh, as in now Thompson Reuters had funded to do something that in our minds today seems both delightful and buggy whippish. And it was to take all this extraordinary Thompson content and be able to make CD-ROMs. And I just, you know, I, and that was, okay, we don't want to rekey this stuff. And we've got Westlaw, we've got textbooks, we've got James Fighting Ships. What if we could go get those assets? And thus began the journey. Um, and there were a couple other, this was in the mid 90s and it didn't have a name at that point. It was still, we were still trying to get content management for the name, but uh, that didn't work out too well. And it was the content industries, Rob, that, that, that banged into this wall first and foremost. Early internet days, it was the studios, the broadcasters, and the publishers, both on the, on the trade side as well as the scientific, technical, mathematical, medical publishing world who found themselves, we're gonna make this thing work. Excellent, excellent. Um, so, you know, I, um, I'm at Meta at IBC, I think in, in 2019. Um, and really what, what jumped out at me is, you know, going back to that, in, you know, my background in working with studios around title management. Um, and, and really just kind of seeing that, you know, the, the industry was changing in, in a lot of respects, obviously, that's always the topic, especially in, in these forums, uh, but around sort of this control and ownership uh, of their data, you know, moving, moving sort of the foundational shift from, from producer distributor to actually producer distributor to end customer. Um, what was your, how did you, how did you hear about Meta? How did you get involved? Because I know that you had some history there as well. I did. I was at IBC when I yeah. had a small presence. At the same time. I, I pr we probably could have been this, the same IBC. And, and I have perpetually walked upon the shoreline trying to find the genie lamp that I could rub and out would pop metadata. And for, for the entire unfolding of asset liquidity, of asset management, of MAM and of DAM, trying to figure out how do we make how do we get these assets enriched and make them discoverable along various striations? And then as dark metadata, lights on metadata, generated metadata became more prevalent, then look, I saw, I saw this company, Meta, and, went, and they're, wait a minute, you can take that and that and collapse going back to one, some of the initial value propositions of, of asset management you can collapse metadata silos? Really? Yeah. It was really fun, Rob. I mean, that, and, and I thought, God, this, if we can get this out there in the world, this solves huge problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, so I, I had a similar experience in that, um, you know, really what we were looking at is, okay, metadata is used throughout, you know, the digital supply chain. And if you, if you walk through those convention halls, there's a tremendous number of really exciting technologies out there. Um, RightsLine was one of them, right? But there's a million others that do kind of, you know, AI and recommendation engines and everything else. 
And foundationally, um, they're built upon sort of access to the objects upon which we're trying to distribute. So in order to take advantage, in, in, my, in my mind, in order to take advantage of all this great new technology, um, you know, Meta really serves as that foundation layer to pull together all these disparate object sets and all the metadata about your titles in order for you to do a lot with them, whether that's, you know, actually powering the, you know, EPGs within your direct-to-consumer apps, or if it's, you know, putting, you know, consensus analysis using, you know, AI on top of it, whatever you want to do, um, really saw it as, you know, kind of that foundational layer, which makes it exciting, I think, um, you know, even as we move into a more, let's call it disconnected world from a services perspective, or maybe a microservices perspective is more, more, more applicable, where, you know, the, the own, where, where data resides using cloud services and, you know, assets and different dam systems, um, the, the lookup function, the metadata repository, can actually exist in a single place where it's connected to external providers like Gracenote. I think Bryce just joined. I saw his messages here, um, like Gracenote or like IMDb, but also to capture it internally, um, you know, as things are being created and maintained in house to keep track of things like, you know, the synopses that you want on your own channels. Yeah, it's been so interesting to see the unfolding of awareness within the studio community dating back to. The, the first articulations, and, and we were both in different pieces of this about digital end and about DEET as, as we referred to it as, and not the mosquito thing. Um, and to understand that if we could achieve liquidity amongst and between these points on the supply chain, that we would be able to sell content differently, to monetize content differently. And I, I remember being in a studio one day when they just, it felt like, the truck had just backed up on the loading dock, although it really wasn't really the truck, but it was the sort of the digital truck. And it felt like a, a, a library that had been acquired by one of the studios was a, a truck of videotapes. Mm -hmm. and, and I, to this day, kind of clearly remember, and no, David, there really weren't videotapes, but uh, it certainly felt that way. And, and the metadata consisted, I, I kid you not, of header information, and that was it. Right. They have not gotten, they've not been able to pull over from the seller's asset management system, even the, the tiniest little itty bitty rounding ears of descriptive metadata. And, and let alone what affirms its place in from a title management and discipline point of view. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because I think that shift, um, the, the onus for the past five years or 10 years or 20 years even, of uh, producing metadata that goes alongside your content as it's being broadcast or played out um, has fallen, you know, historically on the shoulders of the distributors of that content. But as the distributor becomes the producer uh, more and more often, uh, that onus of managing the metadata and all of the various incarnations of it uh, regionally, um, regionally and otherwise, uh, it really, you know, the, the need for a, a very clear system to manage it should, should be in place. And, you know, really where, where I think, you know, Meta is still serving a need here is um, perhaps, let me just throw this out there, perhaps the very first place um, uh, an employee at a studio should go shouldn't be IMDB, maybe it should be their own internal system as the first click. I'm uh, just throwing it out there. It could, could sound like money wasted or time wasted. I mean, time wasted, really, you know. And, and I think one of the things that's so interesting about fluorescing what can happen here is that this is the version of busting the silos 2022 style. Um, it is metadata that that's where, that's where we go to look. And the, this kinetic active living organism called metadata that the language changes, we take care of exclusionary words, and it, we and we enrich it from these various sources. Um, it's certainly at least money that can be saved or, or market opportunity that can be realized. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I'm glad you hit on that point, because I look at, um, you know, our largest customers and how they're using meta. Um, and really, the benefits that come out of it. Um, there's a tremendous amount just around cost savings. Um, so how much time does it take to create placeholders in DAM systems and MAM systems you're, if you're expecting delivery? 
How much time does it take to you know, get a dra draft translation performed by a localization person? And how many titles are you scheduling? And how do you know the scheduling dates? And, and really what we're doing from, you know, from, from the meta software uh, perspective is providing that central place and getting rid of a lot of um, processes and spreadsheets that are time consuming and not additive to you know, the core business of getting content in front of eyeballs. Um, and, and, and that's really, um, you know, in addition to be then being able to actually take advantage of those additional services that I was, I was talking through before um, out in the market. I've often thought, Rob, that if, if Microsoft ever started charging by the cell, you know, <laughs> they replatformed on a subscription basis about how many cells that you use. Yeah. You could finally see some of the aggregated awakening of a centrality of belief in this. And that, it, yes, are there costs involved in bringing metadata in-house? Of course there are. Are there some costs involved in getting a, a uniform view across the landscape of feeder sources? Yes, but um, I think the to start understanding the, the money leakage that goes on right now by spreadsheet-driven workflows, and heaven knows they still exist. Yeah, uh, and and being and having to look in so many different places for metadata brings a lot of overhead with it. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you you couple that with this, you know, the paradigm shift of okay, we've got all these direct consumer apps that you know is is the new landscape, right? Um, and there's a reckoning that's kind of like okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna put this out on our new you know OTT channel platform, whatever it is, and it's like okay, here's all the stuff we can do it from the rights perspective, right? Very familiar with that world. Okay, how do we populate it now? And really that question is like, oh, well we have, you know, back to my original point, oh, we have 14 systems that capture different pieces of all this data. This is the key art system. This is the marketing platform, right? And pulling that together into one spot, which is, you know, um, Meta's ethos around this for sure. And I think it comes at a time where the ethos from Meta, the functional reach of Meta, dovetails with deeper capability within the asset and, and within the MAM and the DAM worlds, where the, the concepts of being able to either within the singularity of a system focused being one of those many systems, which still exist prolifically in the, the studio world and in the big distribution world, but being able to have those, the MAM and DAM I'll say kind of feeder or house systems do more and more and also being able to cross-reference repositories and have role-defined secure ability to look someplace else to find something that may not be in the dam system because dam has also grown up from laying down roots say for example in the marketing and public relations one of the earliest use workflows for dam in, in la was movie poster generation. Mm -hmm. And it was yeah. a, finally, it was, and it sounds so, you know, it's, not, it's, it's neat, you know, there was a place finally, if I made this poster for Malaysia and this one for Brazil, and I hit some trip wires in terms of alcohol or skin exposure and all the typical things, I had some place I could make a workflow and not lose everything. And I think we're seeing such a, a, a logical and required affirmation of being able to put that on a much bigger scale. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, uh, that's interesting. You know, we have a customer that, um, you know, is in the airline space and they use AI to watch all of their videos to find things like competitive airline logos or <laughs> uh, airplane crashes, obviously things, things that are, that, that you wouldn't think of that would normally require someone from a compliance perspective to mm -hmm. watch the entire thing or at least scan through it. Now it's like, I can tell you in you know, 35 minutes and 11 seconds in, we've got the slope. So, but again, in order to take advantage of that, um, you need all these cross-reference IDs. So a lot of times, you know, when, when we're talking to cus current customers or, or prospects, you know, we use this, uh, you use this term, the Rosetta Stone, um, where we have an infinite number of cross-references that are sitting there, be it to IDER, right? Different title cross-references, TMS IDs, IMDB IDs, Common Sense Media IDs, you know, just like a lot of different links in there. But then additionally, where does this sit in, you know, your different supply chain systems, your MAM systems, right? Or, or, you know, or your DAM systems. So here's the image placeholder IDs um, and everything is cross-referenced in one spot. 
Um, then you couple that with your write system, for example, and you, you begin to be able to pull together this picture, much like what you were talking about, which says, okay, um, I've looked into my scheduling system. I've looked into my write system. I know they have the, the rights for this thing. I've scheduled this piece of content to go out um, on an AVOD service in Norway in three months. Okay, look at the asset management systems and tell me of those 500 you've scheduled, which ones don't have Norwegian long synopses or which ones don't fit the, you know, from a compliance perspective for that, you know, uh, direct to consumer app you've got out there. Um, where do I not have the right dubs, subs on the asset level? Where do I not have the right metadata? And basically be able to very quickly um, pull out um, a task list. So you've got this coming up in three months get going, you know, this, this is what you can work through. And, you know, one of our, one of our customers, which is um, Warner Media International, this is, this is their, their daily bread, so to speak. This is what Meta is doing. Um, we're looking at what's been scheduled uh, on HBO Max, all over the world. We're making sure that the synopses are in the right languages and the assets are coupled with those, the right metadata pieces to power those services. And it is saving them so much money. Um, you know, just in resources and time and everything else, uh, because we finally have this like one view that then also is connected to the third party enrichment services, right? So you end up having this like fantastic place where you've got as much metadata as you need, you know what's missing, uh, and you can push the business forward. So this sounds like a little bit of QA to me in what you were in that workflow you were just describing, a little bit of sales enablement, or not a little bit. I mean, this sounds like a big bit of sales enablement. Yeah. So, yeah. So certainly, if, that right, right. I mean, from what you just described. Yeah. I mean, there's there's two sides of it, right? If you're if you're if you're powering your own services, the mm -hmm. sales to the uh, consumer really are about um, you know maintaining platforms that have the right quality to to stop things like churn and all the rest of it. On the on the distributor side, I mean, I would say that you know the majority of solutions or processes that are that are out there are still sending around sort of metadata on spreadsheets about the catalog that is for sale in a given territory on a different on a given media for a given time frame right um or even pretty sort of lookbook type presentations of of, of what's what's available right um and so having all this stuff together and in, in a format as if a consumer would see it really enable sales on that side as well. So, you know, coupling that with the rights data, with something like a, a rights line, uh, really, really creates a super powerful package, um, which is which is what we're seeing. It, it touches a lot of places. It, I, Rob, I was sitting here thinking, kind of looking through the telescope and I'm, I'm looking out at the big world of possibilities. What if I flipped the telescope around and I was in a, in a geography where I needed something localized? You mentioned that word earlier, but is this part of the pulse of kind of flipping it around here? Yeah, I mean, so the so I think it's like having visibility into your entire catalog from a supply chain dashboard perspective, and that's a term we use a lot. So what's your supply chain dashboard? Um, how do I know uh, what's coming up? So I connect into the right systems and I see, okay, great, we've acquired this thing. I need to expect these assets in, right? That's one side of it. Or we've licensed this stuff out. Okay, I have to deliver it. Right, so that telescope allows you to see, like, okay, um, you know, we're we've been selling into, uh, you know, Middle East Africa. Okay, great. How much of our content do we have that's been localized there? We are not a localization pl platform. Right. Okay. And we are, and and we are not, uh, we're not an asset management system. We're not a rights management system. Right. We're we're collecting metadata and connecting those systems together to provide this visibility. Um, so we we certainly do things today. Um, we can like on the localization front, we've got all these great tools out there at our disposal. And this is where it comes into like, how do we leverage all of the great advances we, you know, we as a um, society have made into AI, right? Well, we could just do the translations by linking into Google Translate and uh, AWS's translation services. And maybe that's good enough for a lot of like, second and third tier content back catalog that just is going out on AVOD platforms in a small market, that might actually be good enough. Now, if you need something professionally localized, like, you know, premier content, um, Meta can generate the localization order um, right from seeing the 
triggers that would make that required. In other words, it's been scheduled, it's premier content, you need to send this off to a UNO SDI, okay. right? And we have an integration with them. So you could create it, send it off, it comes back professionally translated with the subs and dubs and everything else into your asset system. So there's definitely some workflow things around that um, that allow you to zero in on opportunities and say, okay, great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take advantage of this. And I think along with that, you, there was a, we've gone through an era a little bit more on broadcast ops and sports broadcast where the, the I'll say kind of keeping track of the trucks as a placeholder for this, where making sure we knew where the, the, the physical material bills of orders were to get, we got these, this, these five are going to this arena and we're going to be doing, a, we're doing a live shoot for this many days and wherever. And one of the things that I saw when I saw Meta was, hey, this is taking care of the metadata trucks, finally. <laughs> I'll have a point of view. And I think there's an, there's an econometric model here that's important to comment on or to use bad English to, to not let go, to not let go uncommented. And it's that the, the concept of understanding, you know, I'll say kind of cost per asset, cost per product, but getting production costs when we know, when we have a better idea of this work order needs to be issued, and I can bring some under better, continually better understanding to the financial basis of what it is I'm selling. Yep. And it's one of those things that Dam and Ma'am should both contribute to if they're seen in that way. And the more these applications spread, and when you've got something like, um, as I've been excited about Meta, where I finally got an octopus brain, and I can see its tentacles go out to metadata and not just a, not just a, the derivative assets and the parent child things that we yeah. do have an opportunity to see, to, to understand valuation conversations or SAP conversations in a different way. Well, certainly, you know, through the sort of M and A view, right, which is accelerating, um, you know, the, the the value of a library that is well organized and documented, and you know where all of the assets and the translations and all the metadata and the rights are, um, is substantial, right? And you know, we're we're entering a world where there's you know lots of noise out there and all the trades saying you know, okay, who's going to combine with who? Are we going to have, you know, kind of, you know, one app that controls a, a whole lot of content somewhere else? And how do you, how do you easily interoperate with, say, another direct consumer app, right? That's not necessarily a traditional broadcaster, right? It's a, it might be powered by one of the studios, but how do you effectively, you know, make your content available on those in a seamless way where it's not a huge heavy lift from the organization, right? So, we, so, so we don't know what the, what the future is going to bring, right? We know that direct consumer apps here to stay, OTT is here to stay, right? But as these things get combined into consumer offerings, you know, like, you know, if you were to extrapolate and say, hey, there's going to be another Spotify, but it's for video, right? What's the easiest way as a content owner, producer, distributor to get your stuff onto those platforms that doesn't involve a huge number of, you know, people and resources and everything else? Um, you know, in the perfect world, you know, as a, if I throw my technologist hat on here, it could be distribute to this, click buttons. We all know all of the complexities involved in the supply chain to make that happen, but we can work. We, we, we can dream here, right? So it's, um, you know, set, setting up those kind of foundations is, is uh, germane to, you know, my, my vision of, of the company and, and the value we can bring to the table. Yeah, and, and I, and I, and I know we're all focused on not having our content wandering around in those container ships at San Pedro. You know, right. we, we do not want our supply chain on those container ships. Um, one of the things that I, I think is in tandem with this, in the private sector now, in the brand, in, the, in both fast consumables and durable goods, there are, are now, there are now some regular conversations when there is at some kind of in that world, merger and acquisition or deaccession activity, where recently Tyson Foods sold off one of its one of its lines and the digital assets there too, um, were it kind of they were excised from the dam system and they were delivered to the like, acquirer of a brand. It is like pictures of chicken nuggets or something. 
You know, um, it was, a, it, I'm not sure. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just playing around. It, it's, uh, I'm sure they were chicken something or other. <laughs> and when we think about that, it so affirms just what you were talking about, that if we're gonna have um, M&A activities, library acquisitions, deaccessions, that we have a, we have a, we need to have a better sense of confidence that if I bring those into my world for prolific use, can I bring them in? Can I cross-reference them? What's the metadata? What if they've got this thing and that thing? And I think it affirms very much the value proposition here. And let me ask you a question, Rob. Okay, who, who does this? You know, if we're wandering around LA, who in the studios, in the, in the broadcasters and in the, the Amazon, Netflix, Hulu kind of aggregation distributors and in the, who, what, who takes responsibility for this? Yeah, I mean, I think that's changing, right? Because, you know, historically you've got, you've got, you know, studios who are paying third party producers to create content, right? And they're really the, the front line in terms of collecting data, right? And you've got marketing. So if you look at all the pieces, it's kind of third party producing uh, organization is shooting a new episodic series in Vancouver and they're doing cast lists and everything else. And some of that data goes to EP and they're filling out certain sheets. Some of that information shows up on IMDb. Grace Note gets that, you know, in that process. Mm -hmm. Marketing then creates assets around it. Really, what you've got if you, is you've got kind of like a systemic, hard to manage uh, data leakage problem, mm -hmm. right? In a perfect world, they'd all just enter it in one place, and the data would be, you know, governed and normalized. Um, but what what's end, what ends ends up happening is title governance groups within the studios themselves are kind of responsible for collecting those pieces and making sure they go into, you know, one system. The reality is it's going into three or four that then all gets combined and then also gets enriched um, from third party providers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's pretty you know it's it primarily falls on operations. But I would say that you know it's changing a little bit in that the request for access to clean metadata is moving further upstream in the process. So, you know, upstream, we're kind of seeing upstream, yeah, we're upstream, like more towards the production side of it. So it's captured early, much mm -hmm. earlier than, hey, now we want to put this on our service. And really that's happening because of the time from, you know, edit, final edit to on the TV screen on the D 2 C app is like, is compressing so fast, right? And all the metrics are out there about sort of the number of hours of content being created and everything else. But as that time compresses, you know, the, the data capture needs to move upstream in the system. I think by, by way of analogy, the, the same pattern is occurring in the brand, in the manufactured goods sector. It's always content that leads the way. This is the hardest object to manage period, end of conversation but a similar kind of upstream pattern is emerging when hard good, when something hard goods is manufactured. Yep. No, it, it, it makes a ton of sense. Um, so I have, a, I have a few slides. I mean, I love to, you know, talk through a presentation. Um, maybe I'll go through them quick, David, and, and we can just kind of uh, go back and forth on some of the topics. We've, we, we've covered a few of them already. Does it sound like a good plan? Yeah, I'd love that because it's been a little while since I've had a live kind of swim in the software. So if you've got some things that abstracted out, thanks, that'd be terrific. Fantastic. Um, so the way that we look at the world, um, you know, in, in a supply chain, in a studio, we can kind of, we always see these parts, right? There might be N number of them in each column. But, you know, content acquisition production um, usually starts in your right system, right? Um, beside that, you have a title mastering system. Um, after that, you've got your MAM systems, your image management systems, scheduling systems, packaging systems, and then, you know, play out like to consumer. Um, and really what sits on top of all these things are different licensors and distributors, obviously from the rights perspective, uh, different certification bodies, localization studios, public domain sources, content producers, what I was talking about before, you know, it's like we need to capture these things further up front. We've also got these external third-party enrichment sources. So we've got the, you know, IDER, Rotten Tomatoes, IMDb, Common Sense Media, Grace Note, and on and on and on. Um, we're connecting more and more AI services into this uh, to do things as simple as image uh, manipulation 
or as complex as identifying an airline logo uh, in a you know feature length film. Um, we've got all the D2C platforms and all the you know DOD partners, affiliates, uh, broadcasters on one side. And then as they're playing out, we've got ratings bodies, viewer data analytics. We've kind of got the whole spaghetti mess. And how this is supported today is through a lot, a lot of people, right? And spreadsheets. Um, so this is all compounded by things like point-to-point -point legacy integrations, um, different legacy apps, you know, departed subject matter experts, and someone doesn't know how the process works. Um, Lack of APIs, which is amazing because it's the end of 2021. And you know, my, again, technology hat goes on. I'm like, everything should be connected in an API driven way, uh, maintaining provenance. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then, you know, there, this has real consequences to that supply chain. So a ton of time spent on, you know, really low value activities, right? That might be, you know, time spent data prep, doing data preparation, low productivity, duplication of tasks, all of the things that sort of uh, gum up the works, if you will. So all this you know, gives a rise to kind of common title and metadata challenges. Um, and what we see out there, it's a lack of governance, low quality metadata, decentralized management, tons of different sources, tons of duplicated attributes. You know, it's like, what did, uh, you know, wh which attribute is the one that controls them if you're getting conflicts from all five of your different systems? Like it's raising these kind of interesting questions. Uh, a lot of manual processes, um, which obviously breeds frustration. I would like to do that to my laptop some days. Um, and then no source of truth, right? And these have real negative uh, outcomes. Um, you know, poor user experiences, inefficient supply chains, lower quality, quality catalog. So where do we focus? Um, really on three things. So categorical source of truth. So centralized management and reference. So we know this is the title. We know this is all the metadata. This is the system of record and it's reference to all of these other things. Super easily accessible, great UI, agile, flexible. Then we take it to the next step and we say, okay, well, we have all these tools. We have these great you know, third-party enrichment partners. So of course the users can put it in, right? But then we can also connect to other enrichment sources and external parties and then connecting the supply chain. So, you know, it's like you have these assets out there, we'll pull in that information. And then of course we have AI and machine learning, which I do have to throw the caveat around that, you know, it's not the magic bullet. I know most people on this call know that, but it's uh, sometimes gets proposed as the, you know, the easy solution. Uh, and then finally, just dynamic and accessible data. The only way this all works is if it's API first, um, you know, really robust security and reporting, um, really, you know, enabling the connectivity of the data to other places. So what Meta does, um, if we look at our core capabilities, um, it's really around title catalog management. Um, you know, that's bread and butter, right? Step one. Uh, not not super sexy, but very easy. You know, like um, really a core component. Um, we get into the next two, which is around metadata enrichment. Um, I think that the enrichment piece of it's super interesting. So if you're, you know, if you're using IMDb, Gracenote, um, we can piggyback on, you know, there's really great data services, pull them in, um, create a supply chain dashboard. So this is really what I was talking about around, okay, you know, where do I need localizations for a market I'm going into? Where do I not have the, the assets themselves? Um, and from that, we can do process automation. Um, that term is thrown around a lot, um, process automation, and what does that really mean? You know, just um, we, we can start off with the simple things. So simple thing might be, okay, well, if we're expecting assets delivered to us, we should in our MAM system create placeholders for those assets that are coming in and then monitor the, monitor the status of those placeholders and pull back certain metadata about the assets themselves, right? Just setting that up, um, you're going to have to log into different systems to do it. Meta's API will call out to you know, our MAM partners and create those placeholders and monitor for inbound deliveries um, and give status reporting out of it. So you've got this spot where you can see like, okay, great, this is being done. And, and that, those kind of things, um, because they're repetitive tasks, uh, save more than just the time in the moment in the task. It enables people to look at much bigger, broader problems uh, because they know these kind of lower level things are just being handled. Um, obviously, advanced reporting, that's where that's, you know, when, when I go back to the process automation, a lot of the advanced reporting enables you to do the more complex stuff, which is 
you know, I have scheduled, have scheduled all of these assets or these titles to go out on my new service and I'm missing this, this information. Could I automatically generate um, reports out of that to say, okay, this stuff has to be localized. How do you want to do it? Um, and, and that's where, you know, it gets pretty interesting in terms of uh, finding problems before it's down to the wire and uh, everyone's scrambling to get something done. Um, the next box here is, you know, we have all this great metadata and a lot of times, you know, internally or externally, you want to see what uh, your content, your product might look like on another service. Um, and so we have a portal that users within the organization can go in and look through all the metadata and look through trailers and look through trivia and box office um, <laughs> box office amounts and, and all of the stuff that, you know, a user might see. That can also be used on the distribution um, side. So, you know, hey, I'm I'm I have a number of customers, and I'm going to license my content to them. Maybe they want to preview what's available in a really nice, uh, nice, clean way. Um, so, you know, those are kind of like our our core components around what we do. Um, and if you look at how this is then implemented you know, within an organization, like a pretty common thing is you've got all these, all these components that we talked about initially. Um, we, we have direct integrations with, um, you know, RightsLine, not surprisingly, some of our other MAM systems, um, MAM system partners, um, or we go through an enterprise service bus um, that connects into Meta. Meta can, then connects out to whatever service you may be using, whether that's, um, you know, Canvas is an interesting one. So from a marketing department, um, Meta will capture the titles and advertisements effectively, the marketing materials, and can use Canvas to pull out sentiment analysis around the, the, uh, the asset itself. So let's say it's a trailer for Star Wars. We can tell you um, what the sentiment is about that one trailer on Facebook, on YouTube. Etc. and can enable some, enable some A and B testing around that. Um, users then, you know, obviously are accessing Meta single single spot, pulling all this data together, uh, and then everything is available uh, through a very robust API. So, you know, with, within the enterprise space, we're making it as easy as possible to kind of connect into this rich repository um, and allow users to get back control, which is, you know, not not only the the title of our of our webinar here, but it, it's really kind of what's happening, you know, out there in the world um, is is how do how to how do you as a you know uh, studio distributor you know control the data that's 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 flowing around given that there's so many sources of it. And that's really how we're pulling it all together. So that's a brief brief um, you know presentation overview. I think that you know as we then kind of go into. Um, happy to do demonstrations for anyone on the call or, or follow-ups from there, but maybe it's um, maybe it's time to maybe ask some questions. We have ten minutes left. If there are questions, or you or you can ask me so, questions, uh, <laughs> gentlemen. Fantastic representation um, and and great conversation. I want to invite our attendees to drop some questions if you have them <clears throat> for Rob or David into the Q and A bin. That's the easiest place for us to round them up. But uh, first of all, thank you um, so much. It was a really great conversation and presentation. Um, Rob, I really like your representation of the whole metadata, digital asset management and supply chain environment. I think that that's something that um, you did a fantastic job. I, I should be on my wall or something. It's a, like, it's a very <laughs> complicated environment, but um, captured pretty well. Um, I wonder, like the, the title of the presentation was, while we're waiting for some questions, um, uh, a couple of things occurred to me. You're talking about control of metadata and um, why it's you know becoming increasingly recognized and important um, for uh, as D2C becomes more and, and more prevalent in this. Studios are starting to distribute content and realizing how much it matters. Um, why does it matter so much? What, what is it that's, uh, what can go wrong if you don't have control of, of your metadata? Um, well, I think there's there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, or that are wrong. That or are <laughs> wrong. But, you know, like one of the, and, and there's lots of simple answers to that, right? Like you can classify your product in the wrong category. So I'm looking for a comedy and I got a horror film. Like that's bad, right? But that's like super straightforward. 
I think there's a more nuanced issue uh, that's out there, which is around, uh, like everything else in our world, we're, we're kind of getting into a more distributed ecosystem. So you've got content producers, say, for example, in South Korea that have created something and it's all in Korean language and it's going out on US platforms or other worldwide platforms. And it's no longer, a, there's no longer a really tight connection between the content distributor and how it's being created. In some cases there are, but it's turned into kind of like, you know, there's the best professional services organizations that produce content and it's feeding into the supply chain. And I think that in order to continue to attract the best content producers, so like Squid Game, you want them to do another, another one around it. Um, there was a fair amount of controversy around that in terms of the metadata that was provided, the synopsises and the translations into English. The producer and creator felt like it misrepresented the context of what he was trying to accomplish, right? And if if you do that too often, or you're not sort of aware of how that's happening, and you don't involve the content creators into those processes through tools like Meta, you can either get a bad reputation, not have the producers want to work with your with with your teams anymore, um, and the ability to take back control goes to both sides. It goes on the creative side. It also goes to the distributor side. So another example, which is a little more nuanced, um, is let's say you have a theatrical release, right? And it's in the US and it's, uh, it's you know, mid, mid, mid number of screens, right? Um, and you, you get back feedback from both the box office results and everything else. And you wanna change that theatrical synopsis now to release onto SVOD and AVOD, mm -hmm. right? Um, in, in a lot of cases, that, that, that initial theatrical synopsis may have been picked up by third parties and you don't have a chance to override that it's gone out in the market you obviously can control on your own services but it's not being it's not being communicated out to other uh other services like an imdb or like a grace note um and really what we're looking to do is and, and what we are doing is saying okay well we got these updates we can update the third parties we can really create that control mechanism so that you're in charge of branding your own products and in charge of the editorial of your own products, which I think is the kind of most, you know, it seems obvious you paid to create it or you paid to own it. You should be able to, you know, control how it is being sold and described in the markets that it's in. And discovered, um, yeah. right? I mean, that's the, as we've got billions and billions of dollars being spent on content and so much of it, uh, discovery and uh, being able to, to surface your content to your customers is increasingly uh, important and vital for its success and your success, and that relies on metadata. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, another, um, I guess, component of metadata is that it's not static. I mean, it, the taxonomies change, the, 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 the terms themselves change, um, and the, 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 the attributes of it change, and they'll continue to change. Um, and, and it's something I think that, that, the, 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 the organizations in our industry want to innovate on, they want to compete on it um, in terms of discoverability, in, in terms of just maybe the, the, the way that content is being described. Um, in, a, in an environment like Meta though, where it's centralized, I have this repository of metadata, um, and how, how can I still have the opportunity to innovate um, with metadata and, and to, to, uh, to um, you know, kind of use use my own competitive advantage in that space potentially. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, so native within Meta is obviously the users or administrative users can control all of the various taxonomies and lists that are used to um, tag content. So, like every other modern app out there, we use this this concept of tagging. Um, so you can you can tag in different categories, whether that's genres, whether that's um, different channel channel groups, different um, affinity groups, um, and all of that's controlled by the user. So we can respond pretty quickly in terms of like, okay, this is what's out there, you know, in in the world of your systems and in third party systems, and here's something, and here's your ability then adapt and change to what's happening in the market, so your con consumers can ultimately find the data. Yeah, Eric, I think there's a there's another shadow in this question too about uh, exclusionary language, about language is very kinetic. Words matter, words are impactful. Look what's going on with Netflix right now where, where an interpretive 
what's going on there. And one of the things within asset management governance is so important is understanding that there's that diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility are, are common our common metaframes, sorry to use that word, Rob, but our, our common kind of substructures to understanding a few years ago, all of us went to lunch and I said, hey, Eric, hey, Rob, I'm gonna go get pizza. You guys want some? It was five, six, seven years ago and you went, me too? <laughs> um, say the word me too today. I live in Washington, DC. I have neighbors who work at BLM and they don't work at Black Lives Matter. They work at the Bureau of Land Management. And it's so the, the, the kinetic dimension of language, asset right. man, good asset managers are, are highly tuned to street slang, to exclusionary language and the changing meaning of words. And it very much fits in with one of the things we can do when we have metadata control systems oh. is restrict the things that shouldn't be there and we can do it quickly and they can feed out into the feeder systems through a tool like this. Mm -hmm. Instead of somebody calling somebody and going, uh, you, you don't, you know, don't call it. We just we don't use that anymore kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, it speaks to a point that, that Bryce made on the Q&A is that the value of having these systems connected and the importance of um, uh, interfaces like APIs to, to have them connected. So if you make a change, you can get that change out into all your distributors really quickly as opposed to sending cocktail napkins and matchbook covers and Excel spreadsheets and smoke signals out to everybody, which, you know, that, that really takes a lot of time <clears throat> and it's really uh, costly. All right, well, y'all, I think we're about at time. Thank you so much. Um, I would love having a, a conversation for the full day actually about metadata. And uh, it's really been, uh, maybe we can do this face-to-face -face sometime too. Uh, that's starting yeah. to happen. Um, okay. So, uh, we can hang out and, and uh, have a libation uh, or a cup of coffee, if you will, and uh, and talk metadata and the systems. I'm really excited to see what uh, more about what what you're doing um, at Meta, uh, Rob. You've done great things in the industry and for the industry. Um, thanks so much, and thanks for being here. Um, I uh, want to also thank all of you for um, for joining us today uh, to this edition of the OTTX. Wednesday webinar series. Um, uh, a couple of things I want to mention. Um, of course, first of all, this session was recorded and it'll be available um, at the OTTX website at OTTX.org, along with a whole lot of other valuable videos and presentations from all our online events for the last year. I um, also want to remind everybody about some upcoming events on the OTTX calendar. On November 18th, uh, right around the corner, we'll be once again in New York City in person and live uh, for the always popular OTTX roundtable discussion groups. It's an opportunity to gather with peers from across the industry, share ideas, learnings, challenges, and best practices about the business and technology of OTT streaming. Uh, this time we're going to be focusing our discussions on ad supported business models, international distribution, and the digital supply chain. Uh, next, on December 7th, we're hosting our annual holiday salon where attendees can join colleagues in some informal off the record conversations about industry trends, opportunities, challenges, while enjoying some tasty appetizers and of course libations. This year the event will also include our first in-person OTTX Impact Awards ceremony where we'll recognize content producers and organizations that are making a positive impact toward the acceptance of and equality for all people. It's gonna be a great night. You can join us there. Um, next, on December 8th, the very next day, we'll be hosting in person again uh, our annual OTTX at Pipeline event at the Skirball Cultural Center in LA. We've got tremendous slate of presentations, uh, panels, research uh, to share, and it's an opportunity to uh, hang out with colleagues and peers across the industry, share ideas, and learn from each other. You can find out more about all of these events and programs at the OTTX website, otxt.x.org. I'll drop the link into the chat right now for information about all our upcoming events. Uh, so you can jump over there and learn more, register um, right from here. Thanks so much, everyone, once again, for being here. And have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Goodbye. Bye.